isn't it true that this government just believes the job of the media is to shower praise on the Prime Minister and the job of taxpayers is to pay for it all? I think it's insulting to think that journalists can be bought off. press in this country because we understand how critical that is to our democracy. Well, if you thought the big controversy about the government's new economic plan would be the deficits, you would be partially right. They're controversial. What about the tax breaks for corporations or no hard plan to help Alberta deal with the oil prices? Yup, those are genuine issues. But after the government announced a $600 million fund over five years to help the media deal with the digital age, well, things got wild, as you saw in that exchange. The Conservatives have openly accused the government of trying to bribe the media before the next election. Liberals say it's just about helping the free press. Which is it? To talk about all those issues, let's bring in the scrum. Tonda McCharles is the senior reporter with the Toronto Star. Joyce Napier is CTV's Ottawa bureau chief. Craig Oliver is CTV's chief political commentator. And our special guest today is Conservative deputy leader Lisa Raitt. All right. Welcome, everybody. i got to start with Lisa Raitt. We've had Bill Morneau, the finance minister, on earlier in the show. Lisa, uh, members of your party, I've talked to them. People like Pierre Polyevra have called this a bribe, the end of objective journalism. Is this the right way or the wrong way to help journalism as revenues are falling and coverage is falling across the country? So, first of all, Evan, um, back in the recession in 2009, our government did indeed help media in terms of having revenues fall off from advertising. So we've been down this road before, but I think what my colleagues are talking about and what the concern is, is what it looks like optically going forward. And I'll give you an example, if I may. If you have organizational links to a source or to the subject matter of a story, a lot of the times you'll see a journalist have to insert in the story, by the way, this, was, um, this organization has this link to us. I'm wondering if going forward somebody is giving a story or, or doing um, a hit and they have to say, when they say government sources, they then have to say, by the way, the government of Canada has provided X amount of dollars to this station. And that's the problem. And that's, I think, what my colleagues right. are talking about. But I'm just being a little bit more specific about it. That's well, you're, the concern you're, of the optics. To, to be fair, you're also being a little gentler. They're saying basically it's a bribe. You can't trust journalism because of that. Joyce, you're shaking your head. I'm shaking my head because, I mean, we are uh, familiar with public broadcasting in this country. And do they always say, oh, by the way, uh, we get our money from the government? No, they don't. Um, and, you know, the end of objective uh, journalism, I thought that ended when we started being accused of fake news. I mean, you know, we're, we're like a favorite punching ball, and I understand that, and, and, and that's fair game. Uh, but this is a more serious issue and a difficult issue for us to tread. We've had this conversation before, and um, it, isn't me, it doesn't mean that because there is a funding coming from the government that all of a sudden we are brainless people and uh, we are sold, and it's not that easy. I, I agree. There's a self-serving element of journalists are talking about this. But, Craig, a lot of the integrity of this, if there is integrity to help, will be contingent upon the so-called independent panel. Now, the criticism mm -hmm. is that the Liberals are appointing the independent panel, but I think a lot of this hinges upon that as to who gets the money. And I'll tell you, there, I think there's some genuinely uh, poignant political questions about that. Well, also the question of what is responsible news organization, right. uh, how much they get, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and who gets it. Uh, very difficult decisions to make. We could find ourselves uh, talking about issues we never dreamt we'd be talking about in regard to uh, journalism in a big way. Uh, Tonda, one of, one of the questions is, I understand no political journalist wants to have the appearance of bias. So the, the help to the, the fact that journalism is in crisis may have a, a unanticipated consequences of creating cynicism and doubt where there may not be some, but it well, may it, actually it, be hurtful. It, well, it may, be, it, it may feed that, especially right. if people like Pierre Poiliev and Michelle Rempel feed the idea that nobody can be trusted and nobody's a professional. But look, yes, this is an awkward thing for us to talk about. Frankly, I'd rather my corporate owners be discussing right. the policy measures and whether they're effective or not in their business model. Uh, but to the point that Lisa made. I don't know that, you know, a disclaimer on the masthead of every paper in Canada would make any difference. Really, the point they're making is, I think, sidestepping the real issue. What they could 
I think, speak about is the policy measures. Stephen Harper's government, Lisa, your government, frequently used tax credits to encourage good behavior. In fact, Stephen Harper in his recent book said it's a great way to promote uh, a civic community cohesion, if you will. So if there is a, a good measure in there, I think it is the measure that prov provides a tax mm -hmm. credit to people who are willing to pay for journalism, to the subscriber okay. themselves. Uh, one thing for sure, the yeah. debate about that we see in the States about the media being front and center in a campaign, fake news, trusted news, it's clearly arrived now in some political way that's here. Let me move on to the deficit, Lisa Rate. Uh, the Liberals have clearly yeah. broken their promise. Remember, during the last election, modest budgets of $10 billion, and they're going to move to balance by the next election. That's not happening. They argue that the debt-to-GDP ratio is going down, so everything's okay. Do you buy that argument? I don't. And what really concerns me, Evan, is the money that they're moving around on the revenue side. We all know that they overspend. We've seen the overspending and we've seen the programming expenses go up. But what I saw this time in the books that really concerned me was a billion dollar surplus in the EI account that they're just taking into general revenues. I saw 250 million coming out of those countervailing tariffs that are supposed to be for steel workers going into general revenues to pay for programs. So they're moving around inside the budget as well that um, hopefully won't have to be there. EI is supposed to be at a balance and those right. tariffs shouldn't be there, but that's the money that they're using. Evan, the, the government, the Liberal government, is really hooked on deficits. It's an alluring drug. It's a feel-good drug. Uh, and it, there are so many more rewards in spending money, giving money to any number of organizations, often very valuable investments. Uh, there are a lot more rewards than there are in putting money into reducing the deficit. And I don't, yeah, think, they're, I don't think they're finished with their spending. I mean, next no, spring, is, a, an election, next spring a is an election budget, an election year budget. And they've left yeah. themselves, I think, they've committed to deficit financing of other big programs like right. PharmaCare. I think we're going to see no end of the spending next year because they've convinced the themselves, if not others, that the country can afford this as long as the economy and keeps growing. There was, as there long was as the economy big, keeps growing. There was a big shadow on this one, and it was Donald Trump. So there was something that this government had right. to do for corporate Canada because they were being lobbied, and rightly so. And corporate Canada was angry at them. Exactly, and 75% of the jobs created in the last three years were created by the private sector. So if you care about job creation, you've got a mind for these companies and that's what they did so they gave them tax credits instead of lowering corporate taxes because that would be a lot more expensive so in defense of it but yes this is obviously spend 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 liberals but in defense of this particular okay. one and what else should they have and done? Next time it will be pharmacare, and yes, they will say we'll use right. the deficit to cover our costs. But of pharmacare, pharmacare is a different. And we'll let the deficit just let it rip. But no, that's a different story. They didn't have though, yeah. Lisa Ray. One thing they didn't have in yeah. there. Yeah, they they absolutely allow corporations and businesses to write off capital costs and investment in equipment. That and I get sense. that. But there was no direct line of help for Alberta, where there's a massive yeah. uh, crisis. The price of oil is at historic lows. Is that cost? that they don't have they don't have an answer there even though the answer well we know one's the pipeline but so far no pipeline yeah great concern last thursday when the prime minister was in calgary two thousand people showed up outside of the hotel where he was speaking to protest it is a real issue and although we may not hear it outside the borders of alberta and saskatchewan it is a serious issue it affects our entire economy and they really didn't have much of anything in there and the prime minister offered words of cold comfort, which is, I recognize that this is a problem, but now you got to do something about it, and we haven't seen it. And the, the concern is, is that it, the anger is getting greater and greater, and it's something this government has to seriously look at. Uh, Brad Wall, the former Premier of Saskatchewan, is saying he has never seen Western alienation uh, so intense. Uh, and uh, he, he knows what he's talking about, and that's got to worry about Trudeau. Trudeau. But it's not, a, it's not enough just to blame Trudeau for all of this. It's, it's larger. It's about responsible uh, Indigenous leaders, especially coastal, uh, coastal chiefs, uh, who are making arguments and going to the courts to stop development. I Trudeau can't interfere with that. We're, we're not Washington. He's not Trump. Uh, we have a rule of law here. He's got to allow that legal process to take its course. I think Craig makes a good point that it's a longer term and larger picture that's unfolded in Alberta and the oil price. Trudeau can't do anything about the world price of oil. Yes, he's done, I think, uh, a significant move in buying that pipeline and trying to advance the effort to get Alberta oil to Tidewater. But 
there's another question. Maybe, you know, it, we, there is a reality here. For, it's fine for Brad Wall to say that, but Trudeau's not going to pay a huge political price because he doesn't hold a lot of seats in those provinces, right? Mm. So, you know, would he, would he, I think, gain by having put in a couple of targeted measures there? Probably he would have. He, he might have deflected some of the criticism, but I don't know that he would stand yeah. to gain any seats. It was tone deaf as far as Alberta is concerned, and I totally yeah. understand that. Tone, completely yeah. tone deaf. They, they, know, they didn't even yeah. mention it, let alone do something about it. They mentioned interprovincial trade barriers. They didn't put money on the table for that, said we intend to talk to the premiers about that. But Alberta was nowhere to be seen. Pipeline was nowhere to be seen, and that's huge. Uh, uh, and how could they? They are the federal government. Alberta is part of the federal government. Uh, it is their territory as well, and they were to completely blind and deaf to that. A lot of Alberta companies, though, in fairness, will be able to take advantage of these tax changes and other changes the government made on uh, Thursday. Lisa, last word to you. I, yeah, uh, just on that, what what is the answer? Like, and I asked Bill Morneau. The answer is clearly the pipeline, but they say it's caught up in its own timeline. I don't know if that ever goes through. Uh, what could they have done in this mini budget? Well, they could have done a lot more. I mean, way back in the spring, the Prime Minister was talking about exploring legislation. He talked to Rachel Notley about that. He uh, certainly didn't say anything about not collecting carbon tax. Rachel Notley had to step in and say that she's not going to charge carbon tax to the oil and gas companies in Alberta. They're really hurting. I mean, it's one thing for us to sit in Ontario and pontificate as what we do in terms of what may be happening there and it's just a phase we're going through and we really can't blame the government. But I gotta tell you guys, this is serious stuff. And this is where a government has to step in and find the tools and the ways to do it. They're the federal government in a majority position. There are things they can do and they should be talking to the PCO about this. All right, I gotta leave it there. Lisa Raid, thanks for joining us this week as our special guest.